Hey, Sanctus Church, good morning. So glad that you're joining us again. Welcome back to the book of Romans. We're almost done, but just let's pause for a second. Why did the Holy Spirit ask us in this ministry year, in this season to go through Romans? Remember, the invitation was for us to rebuild a Christian worldview. It was for us to begin to understand the mercy of God and the reality of our neighbors and ourselves and what he's done and what he's going to do. But it's also begin to show us, to begin to show us how to live differently. And, and last week was sort of this huge turning point. Chapter 12. How do I really worship God now I know Him? And how do I begin to, and how do I define what it means to love a fellow Christian? And even how do I begin to respond to people who hate my faith or people who are destructive in my life? Well, that was a lot to take in last week. But this week, oh my goodness, this week is so much more. Now Paul says, I want to tell you as a Christian how you interact with the government and also with unsaved neighbors and how you actually are in light in a dark world. Now, we had this conversation midway through COVID, and we're going to have it again today. So here's what I'm going to ask. I already felt it in the room. I'm in the room. Lots of you just did this in your hearts, or you literally did this. Can, can you just, can everyone stop, no matter what site you're at, no matter where you're listening in the world, could you just say right now, if you're a Christian, Lord Jesus, I'm open to your word. Okay. Before we get into this passage, I need to do a little history lesson because only when we understand the history of this passage, then does this passage become not just powerful, it actually becomes more radical and even the call more sacrificial. There was an emperor named Claudius. He had expelled all the Jews from Rome because there was actually a huge debate among the Jews about Jesus. You can find that in the book of Acts. After a period of time, all the Jewish community was allowed to come back into Rome, but things were tense. Well, Claudius died, and then after Emperor Claudius dies, Paul begins writing what we're reading today called the Letter to of Romans, and to the Roman Church. Now, this is being written under a new emperor. This is being written and distributed and talked about and prayed through during the middle reign of a guy named Nero. Nero's reign slowly devolves into insanity. And in a few years from this moment, multiple Christians will be killed in the most brutal and horrific ways which we're going to talk about uh, halfway through this message. So it is an unbelievable, difficult moment for this local church. In Rome, at this moment, there's anti-Semitism that is growing. And remember, the Christian community and the Jewish community are intersected at this point because most Jews, uh, Christians, are Jews at this moment. But at the same time now, there's this growing anti-Christian sentiment. So you've got this really bad environment. Paul also understands he needs to address how Christians interact with the government because there was a group of people from Jerusalem called Zealots who basically believed in using violence to throw at the Romans. And part of that thinking was now beginning to take root in the Jewish community in Rome and many Christians were still connected there. And then there's another wrong, wrong attitude that Paul also needed to address. Some people started thinking, well, I'm a Christian and Jesus is coming back and we know he's going to make everything right, so I'm not going to get involved in politics or civic affairs at all. It's a waste of time. It's even sinful. So let's just, let's just let it all burn and God's going to deal with it in the end. And Paul's going to say, actually, that's not allowed either. He's about to charge every single Christian, whether Jewish in background or non-Jewish, to something called horizontal grace. Since God has given us grace, mercy, and kindness, we now are called to demonstrate those things, not only just to other Christians, and not just to non-Christians. We're supposed to even do that to those who are running the government. Responsible citizenship is at the heart of Christian, not just life, worship. So Paul commands the Christians residing in Rome, and then all of us with these words. Romans 13.1, undo your arms. I'm open, Lord. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So, okay, everyone, let's start here. If you're a Christian in the sound, within the sound of my voice right now, if you have named Jesus Savior, Leader, and Lord, then Paul says, and remember, this is inspired, this is God's word, you must, as a Christian, be subject. That, that word means you must submit, you must stand under the government. This word is a military term, subject. It's a voluntary deference to the wishes of another. The starting point for Christians is submission 
not my rights. Uh Uh-oh, uh-oh, let me say it again. The starting point for Christians is submission, not my rights. God's word says it here in black and white. God has established the idea of governments and established establishes actual governments. Though God remains ultimately in control, governments are given limited amounts of autonomy. They're good sometimes, they're boring sometimes, they're bad sometimes, but God in the end always uses them to accomplish his purposes. As one wrote, after God created the world, he filled it, he organized it, he gave purpose to each created thing. When governments establish laws and prosecute justice, they honor his created order, even when they don't do it perfectly. And anarchy... Is just bad for everyone. Okay, so here's where we're starting. Obey the law as a Christian. Remain productive. Pay your taxes. Stop at red lights. Don't steal. Don't invade another person's privacy. Don't rob banks. All these things are good things. But see, the common good isn't enough. See, this whole conversation is about worship for Christians. And notice the power of the statement, this verse 1. Resisting the government is fighting against God's plan and authority for the world. Many of you don't like the government. You post things about the government 24-7. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. So I would like to stop and ask every single Christian this this morning. When is the last time you stopped and said out loud, God established the idea of government... God has established the government ruling my nation right now. It's his will. Lord, help me submit joyfully. Have you even prayed that? Now, okay, I know where you're going. Tons of people are like, John, I said, yes, of course this has been totally misused. This is not teaching blind devotion to the government either. Many churches under the time of Hitler used this very passage to say, well, you can't stand up against Hitler, or you should never resist the Nazis, or actually, we should join them. We're going to get into the question in a minute, like we saw actually even in the life of Esther. When is it okay not to obey the government as a Christian? And we're going to walk that through in detail, but see, here's the problem. So many of you right now as I'm speaking are already there. When do I get to say no? Whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. Stop jumping there so quickly. Just let it sink in right now. Your worship is connected to your thoughts, your actions, towards those who have authority over you and over us. This is as important as singing on a Sunday morning or giving, giving on a Sunday morning or sitting under a sermon. So let me just do this again. When is the last time you said, Lord, help me to joyfully submit to the government as worship to you? I'm just going to take a moment. When's the last time? Probably never. Verse 2. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authorities rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. There's two reasons why we should obey the government. One, it allows us to worship, to please God, to honor Him. It's connected to how we honor what He set up in the world. Second, it allows us to serve God freely. If we keep uh, disobeying the law, we'll get fines, or our reputations will be bad. Prison, it kills our testimony. And as a general rule, a general rule, the more you obey, the more free you are. This is a pretty profound thing. There was a guy named Richard Halverson. He was the former chaplain to the U.S. Senate. This is what he wrote about government. To be sure, people will abuse and misuse the institution of the state. People, because of sin, have abused and misused every other institution in history, including the church. But that does not mean the institution is evil or bad or should be thrown out. It simply means that people are sinners and rebels in God's world, and this is the way they behave with good things. As a matter of fact, it is because of this very sin that there must be human government to maintain order in history until, of course, the final, ultimate rule that Jesus will establish— Human government is better than anarchy. One. Oh, and here's, here's the line that's going to really mess with a lot of you. And the Christian must recognize the divine right of the state. Hello. What that means is the idea of government is God's idea. He says in verse 3, Rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. 
Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. As a general rule, of course there's exceptions. As a general rule, just obey and things will go better for you. If you break the law, you'll always be looking over your back. But if you do obey, there'll be much less fear. And of course, you're a Christian, so of course. Then he says, for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. If you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They're God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on wrongdoers. Now, the sword 2,000 years ago was a symbol for Roman judicial power. And basically, God has given authority of law and the consequence of law to governments. Now, here's the really mind-blowing thing. I hope you're still listening. It says that politicians, government officials, are God's servants. Why is that so? Well, I'll tell you why. In the Old Testament, the Greek version of the Old Testament, this is the same phrase used for priests worshiping in the temple. And in the New Testament, this is the same phrase used for deacons serving in a church. So when is the last time you said that Doug Ford or Jatman Singh or Justin Trudeau, if you're American, uh, Biden or whoever or wherever you live, is actually God's very servant? Whoa. Therefore, because of what I just said, Paul says, verse 5, it is necessary to submit, live under, to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. So here's the best summary. We don't just obey because we don't want to get in trouble or lose time or reputation or money. We obey as a matter of conscience. That is, this is God's will. We as Christians know the true living God and love Him and want to follow Him as Savior, Leader, and Lord. So when we obey the government... We actually worship God. And then Paul brings it right home. He talks about worship in the strangest and most uncomfortable of places. He talks about taxes. You're like, taxes? Yes, taxes. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Now, lots of us don't like paying taxes because actually we just don't want to give our money away. But also, we don't like the government or how they'll use our taxes. You can fill in the blank for yourself. Uh, The Jewish community and the Jewish Christian community 2,000 years ago struggled with this because Rome was an outright pagan, dangerous group. And it wasn't about greed for them. It was an issue of holiness and worship. The average Jewish person thought by paying taxes, it was giving God's money to Caesar, Rome, and all the bad stuff they were doing. Like many Christians today, you might say, well, I don't want to give money to the government because it supports abortion, or I cannot believe what our government's doing in this gender revolution moment, or I can't believe that they're buying tanks, or you just fill in the blank. Okay, what did Jesus say in Matthew 22? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. I love when one person reflected like this. With this single sentence, Jesus, our Lord, established the validity of human government. Well, at the same time, set limits. Caesar had his image on certain things, and they rightly belonged to him. There is a proper domain and function for human government. However, God has stamped his own image on people. Intellect, will, soul, bear the divine stamp. Thus people may give outward things to Caesar, but the inner person belongs to God. Jesus is saying here, the coin is from the mint of the Roman Empire, but you are from God's mint. The coin you use determines, it is determined by its likeness, and your use is determined by the likeness you bear. Basically, he writes, Jesus' single sentence is certainly one of the most important political statements ever made. So simply, Jesus and Paul teaches us, give your taxes. It's for the common good. It's connected to your worship when you do this. It's connected to your worship when you do this. There was a guy named Ray Stedman who did a lot of thinking in the area of faith and politics. And this is what he said, thinking on taxes. He says, you have a right, of course, as everyone does, to protest injustice or correct abuse But don't forever be grumbling about taxes that you have to pay. He said, I had to learn this lesson lesson for myself. The first time I paid income tax was a few years ago. My income had been low for so long, I never paid any taxes. And gradually it caught up, and finally when I had to pay, I remember how much I resented it. In fact, he's an American, when I sent my tax form in, I addressed it to the Infernal Revenue Service. They never answered, but they took my money, he said. The next year, he said, I improved my attitude when I addressed it to the internal, eternal revenue service. 
He says, but now I've repented from all those sins. And now I hope to pay my taxes cheerfully as a Christian. So Paul teaches us in using taxes as an example, it's for the common good, it's worship, it's how you honor, it's actually how you obey. And then he goes farther, he says, you know what, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe them taxes, give them taxes. If you owe them money, revenue, give them revenue. If you owe someone respect, give them respect. If you owe them honor, then honor them. See, we are called as Christians to fulfill the requirements of good citizens. We should be the best citizens, by the way, in Canada. And by doing this, it also might create opportunities to share the good news with greater freedom. Respect and honor are key when we deal with anyone beside us, below us, or above us. As one person brilliantly said, as Christians, we might deplore the politics of a particular party or person in an office. We may be repelled by his or her scandalous conduct, but that does not disallow us from uh, respecting their office as a Christian. You know, Peter took it farther, and if you're uncomfortable now, you're going to get really uncomfortable next. Peter wrote this. Remember, Peter used to be involved in, like, rebelling against the Romans, pretty tough, cut people's ears off, like... 1 Peter 2.13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake as worship to Jesus to every human authority, whether to the emperor as supreme authority or governors who are sent by him to punish those who are doing wrong and commend those who do right. Verse 17, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers, the church, fear God, honor the emperor. Okay, Peter says... Honor and submit to every authority, including the emperor. Who's the emperor at this moment? Oh, it's Nero. Okay, ready? In 64 AD, a very famous fire, some of you know this, broke out in Rome. It devastated the grand city. Tons of people died, so much was lost, and the population and the government blamed Nero. And there's a lot of facts to say maybe it was his fault. But no matter where that lands, here's what one historian said. Nero was a man desperate to be popular. Therefore, he decided to look for scapegoats that he could blame the fire on. And he found it in Christians. And this is when this began. So he said, oh, the Christians started the fire. So many Christians suddenly were arrested and they were thrown to literally like lions in the circus and eaten alive. They were, tons were crucified. Many of them were literally, this is awful, burned alive at night, serving as lights in Nero's gardens while he held parties. The brutal persecution which immortalizes Nero's reign is why the Christians called him the first type of antichrist in the Christian church. And Paul and Peter, writing at this point, actually say, are you ready, everyone? Submit to Nero. Nero If Christians are called to honor Nero, then you could totally honor our prime minister or our premier or or police or or teachers or pastor. Like, what? Uh, Paul moves us to look around at our relationship with neighbors and coworkers and family. And he says, let no debt remain outstanding except for the debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Uh, See, many people misuse this. Verse 8, oh, you see Paul saying you can't borrow money and banks are evil and mortgages are evil and you should never have a credit card. No, no, this is not what it's being taught here. The idea here is do not let debt become an addiction. Don't default on a loan. Being part of a faithful Christian is actually being a good neighbor. I love when one person said, be a person with honor as a Christian. Fulfill your obligations. Don't make creditors track you down. Seek them out. Be honest and forthright. Pursue the arrangement to pay off what you owe. If someone holds a particular position that's due respect, then give it freely with enthusiasm. With enthusiasm. Not begrudgingly, not, oh, I'm a Christian. I have to honor them. With enthusiasm. See, this is a call to love your neighbor. The only debt that we should have with anyone is love. See, that's why in this next moment, Paul actually turns back to the Ten Commandments, to the second half, actually. And we did a whole series on the Ten Commandments. I don't know, maybe 2009 or 10, you can watch that whole thing. But we've been learning through Romans 2. Why were the Ten Commandments given? Well, the law shows us the character of God. The law shows us what sin is. The law actually shows us how lost we are. We need a Savior. But the law also shows us a vision of how humanity is supposed to work. 
This is how the whole created order is supposed to work. It's all about love. That's why he intentionally uses the 7th, 6th, 8th, and 10th commandment. He says the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. Whatever other commands there may be, they're summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Paul is saying, listen, if you really love God as a Christian, then you'll have to love neighbors. And if you really love God and you love your neighbor, then you would never or encourage or get involved with committing adultery because that destroys your neighbor. And you'd never actually get involved in murder because that destroys your neighbor. Or you would not hold hate in your heart and bitterness long term because that destroys your neighbor. And you would never steal someone's reputation in a conversation when they're not in the room because that would destroy your neighbor. Or you would never steal someone's reputation online, right? That, or you wouldn't steal a car or you would, because that would destroy your neighbor. You would not live a life that's motivated by what you don't own physically, emotionally, sexually, spiritually, financially, and covet. I mean, this is how we are called to live in a cold, uncaring, me-centric world and be tr- tr- truly different. Okay, Paul brings everything home this way with the idea of when we're living. He says, look, we're living in the last days. The days are really short and Jesus is going to return. So do this understanding the present time. Okay, there are two words for time in Greek. One is chronos. We get our English words like chronology or calendar from it. It's linear. And the other one is kyrios. Kairos, sorry, it's kairos, which means a fixed or appointed season. It's a God special moment time. It's a quality of time. And he basically says we're living in this unique end time moment. He says, so, okay, understand the time. Because if you don't understand the time, you won't live right. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer than ever. It's nearer than we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Jesus is now closer to coming back when everything's going to be made right. So actually begin to live like he's really going to come back and make things right. And remember most things that we care about or love or fight about won't have any weight when he returns. So our Christian ethic and our love and our obedience to Jesus is grounded and motivated because we know time is short and things are going to change and he's really coming back. He says, look, it's not just about the government stuff or debts. He says, let us behave decently, verse 13, as in daytime, not carousing in drunkenness, not in sexual morality, debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Now, we talked a lot about this last week, but he says, listen, we shouldn't be involved in carousing and drunkenness. This comes... Uh, at least in this context, from the idea of wild nighttime festivals and honoring this god called Bacchus, who is the Greek god of wine. And basically people get drunk out of their minds and then do all this sexual stuff. It's like, no, the party scene, not our scene anymore. Um, The internet. (laughs) The internet is this. I think 60% of the internet is porn. Uh, It's brought it into our homes. And he's just like, look, whether you do stuff in secret or in public, something that's shameful according to God that's normal and experienced and expected in our culture, we, we just aren't marked by that anymore. And, oh yeah, we're not marked by sexual morality. Sex is defined by God's word, not by us, culture, feeling, history. No. And also dissension and jealousy, infighting with passion. No, no. He says, clothe yourself. Rather, clothe yourself, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of your flesh. Rather is not a neutral word. It's actually, it's a word in Greek reserved for like a sharp contrast. So we must, with an absolute unequivocal view and way, obey Jesus and not darkness. It takes forethought and planning. He says, place the Lord Jesus Christ on you. Clothe yourself with him. Bow to his ideas, his commands, his lordship. He's the king of kings. He's the lord of lords, and he's good. Okay, let's keep going. What do we do with this passage? (laughs) Well, number one, if you're a Christian, you need to respect and obey the government as worship towards God. Now, don't forget, Paul never even shares what form of government is best. He's not thinking about democracy here. His point is your thoughts, your online posts, your attitude, your conversations, do they reflect worship and are you submissive at all to those who lead you? Uh, Let's also not forget what this passage is not saying. 
uh, Paul, Peter, Old Testament, Mordecai, Esther, Jesus. None of them are naive about government abuse or power. Uh, uh, the guy who's writing this has actually been abused multiple times by the government he's telling us to submit to. And Paul even is talking, talks in other passages about he knows behind institutional power there are literal spiritual principalities, powers, rulers, and authorities that are hostile to God himself. So again, can we ever disagree? Can we choose not to obey? Yes. This is one passage among many. There are, keyword, rare occasions when we have no choice but to obey God over the government. You're like, well, when are those? Well, here they are. First of all, when a government tells us to violate a direct command of God revealed in the Bible, we say no. In Acts 4, 5, for example, the church was told they weren't allowed to use Jesus' name anymore or preach. Peter and John say, I think it was Peter and John say, we must obey God rather than people. The command of God takes precedent. So if anyone says, oh, you, you, can't, you, know, you can't preach Jesus as the Son of God, or Jesus is the only way to heaven, or you can't talk about heaven or hell, or if we're told we can't call people to repentance, or if we, if we are told that we cannot call people to self-denial, or if we are told we cannot speak about life or sexuality or gender from a biblical-informed worldview, we just will not obey. We will obey God, not people. So that's a time when we can say, no. God over you. Number two, you can disobey if you are told to commit a sinful act defined in the Bible. So if someone asks you to lie, no. If someone asks you to kill, no. If you're asked to affirm things God has clearly said no to, then we also say no. So if you're a Christian doctor or nurse here today, and you're told you have to perform an abortion or get involved in euthanasia, you say no. As a general principle, I know there are some exceptions, but as a gen- no, I, I'm not doing that. You might lose your job or be demoted, but you obey God's word rather than others. If your boss at work tells you, you know, change some notes or change a file or lie or, or you know what, I don't really like this person anymore, let's set them up. No, in Jesus' name. You have every right to say, I'm not doing that because actually I'm a follower of Jesus. Now it's this third one that's really, really difficult, important, but has been misused, especially during the COVID pandemic in the last three years. If something goes against a Christian's conscience, informed by Scripture and the Spirit of God. So, there is not agreement between Christians on all matters. Are you shocked? I'm not. So here's an example. Many Christians could never work on nuclear weapons. Others say, I could never be in the entertainment community. Other people are like, what are you talking about? The only way that you are salt and light is when there's darkness and rottenness. So the only way to be a witness is not to hide from the world, you've got to be part of the world. War and pacifism is a great example of this. Many, many Christians say, no, there is a time when we have to take up arms, defend the weak, or actually take out a wicked government because actually they're so dangerous. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was uh, leading the church uh, during the Nazi regime, who was jailed, and incredible story. He, in the end, joined the plot to kill Hitler. Other Christians say, no, no, you don't understand. It is never right to pick up arms. We need to be pacifists. That's what Jesus taught us. Both of them actually root their views genuinely in Scripture. Now, here's some ground rules I just want to give you. And by the way, if you're starting to yell at me in your heart, shh, don't. Just listen. Number one, You've got to base it in God's word. You've got to find it in here. Not on your Twitter feed, not on a vlog, not on some website, here. And actually find it. Not one verse. Number two, think. Take time to think, not react. Not just two posts and I read a website. No, no, think. Number three, check it out with other Christians who agree and disagree with you. Now, if you come to a position where you actually are like, okay, I, as a Christian, I feel the Spirit of God has told me this. I find it in Scripture, but I do not have unity with other Christians. Then here's the ground rule. You can't make it a rule for everyone else. If it's clear in Scripture, do not do this thing, then we all agree. If it is not clear in the Scriptures and it becomes a matter of conscience, which, by the way, Romans 14 and 15 are all about, then you need to say, well, you know what? I'm choosing not to do this, but I will never disrespect, attack, or say you're sinning by doing the thing I disagree with as a Christian. 
And here's the real strong reality some of you are going to have to admit. If you read Romans 14 and 15, you're actually the weaker brother and sister in this conversation, not the people actually you're angry at. So yeah, you can say no and say, I'm choosing not to do this thing. But when you make it universal, and when you say all other Christians must, you yourself have started sinning in a different direction. Okay, so where does this leave us? Okay, this is where this, this, is where this goes. Number one, if you're a Christian, God commands you to honor your leaders. It's not a choice. 1 Peter 2.17 Show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. Honor leaders. Do you do this? Do you, do you do this? There's so much rancor, so much hatred. So, there is so much that is posted by people in this church that a year and a half later, actually they changed their mind on or they never addressed. They've never come back online and said, Lord, and, to, and online, I'm sorry, I didn't honor people. So just, number one, honor leaders. Number two, respect every person you meet. All people, people from different religions, different political stances, different views, different moralities, different sexualities, treat everyone you know with dignity. Treat them the way you would want to be treated. Does this mean when I honor someone or I treat someone with dignity, I have to agree with their position, justify their lifestyle, believe what they believe? No. Jesus sat with people all the time and had coffee or meals all the time with people who were tax collectors colluding with the Roman government and sex trade workers. He wasn't saying what they were doing was right, but he understood if you're not with them, how will they know? Human dignity is connected to being made in the image of God. Not money, not status, not power, not race. If you actually stop seeing human beings made in the image of God, you'll dehumanize them. You'll demonize them and you'll miss the whole point. So number one, honor your leaders and respect people. Honor your leaders and respect people. Honor leaders in all spheres of your life. Respect people. Number two, pray for your leaders. This is a command in 1 Timothy 2.1. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, especially for kings and those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. Pray for your leaders. Pray for spiritual leaders like me and others in this church, but not just us. Like, pray for politicians. Pray for our prime minister. Pray for those who are in the police for Pray. And, and, and by the way, don't pray, oh God, go get them. Look, pray for wisdom and patience and the fruit of the Spirit. And like, pray that you'd bless them. Honor leaders, respect people. Pray for leaders. Number three, don't break the law because the law might be used in a wrong way later. Please hear this. The Bible never lets Christians preemptively break the law. Does this mean we should never voice our opinion? Of course you should. Does it mean we should never vote? No, please vote. Vote carefully. Uh, Of course we want to make laws open for all. And yes, we want to have righteousness in our land through the law. And yes, we should be very involved. But your tone matters. Context matters. Oh, here's something. Truth matters. Oh, and what's more important than all of that? Oh, here it is. The gospel matters more than all of it. Let me just share something from my own life. Listen, um, I will never have a lawn sign or ever on the front of my lawn telling people who I'm voting for. Never as a Christian. Uh, If you've noticed, I I do not post who I vote for. Why? Because here's what's more important than than that. I want to make sure that I can share the gospel with everybody. And who I vote for is fine and good and needed, but actually the thing that really matters is the gospel. So many of your feeds are so full of everything but the gospel of Jesus. Jesus. So here's some questions for all of us. What do you need to change in your thinking when it comes to worship? What do you need to repent of publicly and privately? Posts, thoughts, actions, lack of honor, lack of submission. What do you need to keep working out? 
What do you need to wrestle with and struggle with? Who do you need to talk to so you're not in an echo chamber of those who just agree with you? The invitation by God for many of you is to actually believe God's going to make things right in the end and actually you aren't going to make it right in the end. He is. There is an invitation for lots of you to repent. For, to, for some of you to learn submission. For others to realize that actually um, the focus has been wrong. Another thing is we need to be people of honor. We need to use our money well. And we need to make sure that we are people that (laughs) deals with debt appropriately. But actually, deeper than that, we just have to throw off darkness. I, I love when I read someone who said this. He says, I encourage my own children. And he says, actually, I need to encourage myself. And, and, and this is what he says. He says, I have stopped asking myself, can I do this? I.e., are Christians allowed to do this thing? I now ask a new question. Should I do this action? Does this activity glorify God and honor Jesus whom I represent? Not just can I do this, should I do this? I think that's a great starting point as we're trying to work out how we interact with unsaved neighbors and friends, how we deal with enemies, how we interact with the government, how we interact with each other in church. But the real point in this passage is it's a reminder Jesus is coming back. And are you living like he's returning? Like, is all of this grounded in this idea, wow, he's going to come back and things are going to be made right, and I sure want to be ready when he returns, and I want him to find me find me in this space, ready and living out for him when he comes back. I know this passage is hard. I know it's fraught with difficulty. I know it's been misused. But I also know it's been ignored. And so the invitation is, since we're praying, right, that we'd have a biblical worldview, and also we're really, really praying that we are formed by the Scriptures, this is a real simple way to do this. How do I deal with these things well in my life? So Lord, what we've just heard was just as difficult uh, as last week was. And because of the last three years, maybe even more difficult. And I guarantee as I'm preaching, I know at Sanctus there's no unity on this stuff, let alone beyond. But here's my prayer. Holy Spirit, take my words and take your word. And would you uh, bring healing this week, repentance this week, uh, trust this week, submission this week, uh, Holiness this week, light this week. Would this stuff really be worked out on the ground? And Holy Spirit literally birth this among us because this is your will. Help us, Lord, to do the impossible, we pray. Form us by your word and give us joy to do these things well. In Jesus' name, amen.